everybody. Welcome to the show. It's the Blathering. I'm Ken Napsock. This is the podcast. It used to be called the Napsock Files. It used to be called Saturday Night Napsock. It's on the Napsock Network. All those shows still exist. They're still on this feed. So, hey, go back. Listen to some old interviews. That, I don't know. I don't know if they still stand up. Listen to Saturday Night Napsock. I still think that stands up. Still some of the uh, some of the most favorite uh, art out there uh, that I created. I'm actually proud of it. Very rare that I'm proud of things. But I'm proud of this show. It's a chance to sit back and uh, talk about life. As it comes to me, as it comes to you, as it comes to my head, as it comes to my heart, as it comes to my soul. It's too long, like a bumper sticker catchphrase, but we'll workshop it. Uh, this whole show is a workshop. In the past, I've come on here and gotten um, gotten upset. I've been upset over things in the world, political things, uh, social things, uh, things that happen, emergencies, uh, tragedies, disasters, things that shouldn't be but are. And I just, you know, I can't, I can't right now. I can't. But doesn't mean I wasn't affected by the the shooting, uh, the the mass shooting at the retail uh, outlet center uh, in, in Allen, Texas. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a mileage may vary for all of us. Uh, I have a first re- responder blood. I have that security career. My my past is as a public safety director, and this is something we we did dread every day, even when this was less prevalent. Though it was always prevalent, uh, I would drive to. Um, to work and you actually play it out in your head. Like I've, I've talked before, almost like in a sickly obsessed way. Like, Ooh, I hope today's the day we have some tragedy that I can, uh, you know, get some action in that. That's kind of the, the messed up thing uh, about long, long-term uh, careers in fields like that. And, and that's just a, a public safety spot. Imagine uh, sworn uh, peace officers and, and, and fire and emergency and medical personnel. Uh, but I, yeah, so so me not coming on here and doing angry internet guy thing here today is, is simply because I just what what more can be done other than to vote in politicians that will take some sort of action, right? On on any side of it at this point for me, the words are nice, the the hard tweets are nice. Me me yelling on a podcast that's nice. It doesn't fix anything. It doesn't take away from tragedy. But I focused on them. I, I I I've been reading articles. I don't, you know, if, if you're out there, again, mileage may vary. And maybe you don't want to face um, the trauma in the sense of there's some very real things that you just don't need to hear or see or read about. I'm with you, so I'll, I'll withhold anything. But, I, you know, I was, I was looking at some of the faces of the victims that were they were showing and just the, the path to this situation. And, and one of the victims was a 20-year-old security guard working this, uh, sound like an outlet center, not like a necessarily a mall in the classic sense, but more of like a, a out, outlet, outdoors, uh, outdoor outlet center. Whatever the layout was, doesn't matter. Um, people are dead, tragically. I was listening to the the witness. I think his name's Stephen Spanhauer, former military, former law enforcement. I believe, believe from some some articles I was reading. But cowboy hat wearing middle aged guy. His son calls him from an H and H and M. Manager of the store, and dad is shooting here, and he goes down there, and he's actually um, one of the first on scene. There was the officer who was uh, on scene for a separate call who engaged and in, in, um, uh, uh, killed the uh, shooter. But then this this guy, this uh, Mr. Spanhauer guy, was uh, going around telling the media uh, what he saw. And, and it's probably too graphic for, for many people. I'm not one that says, hey, you need to face that stuff because it's reality. I think we all know the reality. And it's uh, okay to not have those details if, if you don't want them. Um, but he was telling some pretty graphic tales and – yeah, and he's he's the type of guy just by look that I think we need on cameras right now going, this ain't right, and this could happen to your community, and I don't want to have anyone else go through what I went through, including just the fact that his son called and said, Dad, there's a shooting going on at work. Uh, I think that's that's valuable. Um, and I so, you know. I'm sorry, you know, I I might have some gallows humor in this episode. I might I'm gonna switch subjects. I, I can't do an entire episode on this. All I can do is uh, try to influence those around me to just at least think of big pictures, think of what you're defending, think of what you're actually talking about when you uh, think overlook this stuff. Uh, I will continue to go to one of the most feckless, pointless leaders in our national scene, Governor Greg Abbott of, of Texas. Pointless individual. Pointless individual. 
uh, well, what we have, that you know, gun control is a short-term solution. It's really a mental health problem. If I have one more person, I have one more friend. I have some friends that will say this to me. Well, you know, it's really, this is a gun issue described as a mental health, d- d- disguised as a mental health issue. No fucking shit, Sherlock. I haven't used that one since like fifth grade. What are you going to do about it? You're going to keep slashing funds to uh, fund mental health, uh, um, meds, doctors, resources. You know, that that's where we're at. That's where we're at. It's influence those around you. Love those around you. Keep your eyes peeled. I'm a realist. I'm a realist. Go into these. We all have to go to them at some point. You're going to go into a store. You're going to go to a public event. Going to be in a hospital. You got to go to school. That's the real scary thing about this. We shouldn't have to deal with this, but we are. So I always say keep an eye. It doesn't hurt to walk in and go, how do I, in your head, go, how do I get out of here? We don't have to live like that, but that's where it is. But that uh, that shouldn't work. That shouldn't be where it stops, which is why I also get so angry at those who who cling to this stuff, uh, cling to this, uh, this uh, you know, it ain't the guns. Put metal detectors in schools, uh, teachers with guns. Sure, sure, sure. And you know, it is, it is, it is a mental health issue, right? How many times have I said that on this show and everyone has said it? You can go find 40 videos right now on YouTube of people going, it's a mental health issue. So, you know, I guess America's the only country with a mental health problem, right? Uh, even if you feel, uh, well, this nation is turned away from God. Okay. I, I, I think probably other nations have as well. It's a big difference. Big difference, and I think we all know what that difference is. So there's nothing more I can say about it other than I think my only hope is that there's a generation coming up behind, not even my generation, but the millennials behind me. I think it's generation or two or three now who are going to live with this and look at this in a different light. And once again, I'll reach over to another area that I talk a lot about, which is that Star Wars area. You don't believe this kind of generational change happens and, and, and how it could be looked at as, as hopeful in a dark situation. Uh, you know, recently, uh, Return of the Jedi was re-released in theaters 40 years uh, ago. The movie hit hit the streets in, uh, in May of 83. So here it is in May of 2023 for 40th anniversary. They released it in select theaters. And, of course, they showed, like, the special, special edition versions. Not even the version that was released in 97. But the version that included uh, Hayden Christensen and the, and the Force Ghost Spot. And, you know, there's a lot of people. I understand it, but a lot of people my generation, um, when that first hit, especially when that first hit, where it was outrage, you know, the Han shot first bullshit, uh, Victory celebration music over Yub Nub. All those kind of things that George did along the way up into the mid 2000s where he introduced Hayden over Sebastian Shaw. And, you know, that was a get to your cars and be angry kind of thing. Much like some, some stuff going on with the prequels, right? It's, it's several friends go see Return of the Jedi this past month, this last two weeks. And all of them reported the same thing. That when these moments that often uh, would cause, like, our generation consternation and grief. They put Hayden Christensen over Sebastian Shaw. George, what did you do? Vader says no now. What a, the Ewoks blink. Yub Nub is the greatest John Williams composition in the world. Well, how could you get rid of it? All that stuff, gone. In fact, it was the opposite. The fans that grew up with the special editions or grew up with this version as the version. By the way, do I think the original should still be available for purchase or viewing? Yeah, yeah, I got them. It's an interesting timepiece. Uh, you know, that's a different debate. I think I think in the end, George has a right to do what he wants with his goddamn art. But I also understand going too far. I, I sure, get it. You can start your own podcast, podcast and talk about it. But the point is, this other generation grew up with this stuff. They grew up with the prequels. They grew up with 
Hayden's in Return of the Jedi because of course he would be. Who's old man Magoo? We don't need that guy. We need Hayden. And so when Hayden came on the screen, people applauded. When the Ewoks, the Ewoks that caused my generation from 1983 on to be pissed off about George putting in teddy bears for toy purposes. Ewoks uh, come on screen. Uh, my podcast partner, Justin Scripture, I was saying, Wicket's feet, his feet alone, caused an audience to applaud. That is generational change. Where you, you, you look back on the things that caused people problems then, and, and you look at the generation that came up underneath all that, they view it differently. And that's for the better of all of us, a society, and the world. And if we can do that with something like, you know, the prequels, if a generation now, 20 years plus after Phantom Menace can go, no, we stand for Jar Jar because what he meant to us then, he didn't mean that to you, but you didn't grow up like us. You couldn't grow up like us, just like we couldn't grow up like you, but this is how we view the Jar Jar situation. We like him and we love Ahmed best. If that can happen and something is silly, but also is pointing to Star Wars, it can happen and is happening in our society. You've already seen it now because going back to Columbine in 99 and going forward, those aren't kids anymore from Columbine, the ones that went through that and survived that trauma. They're parents now. They're parents now. And they're running for office and they're voting and they're raising their kids differently. Sandy Hook was over 10 years ago. If you're an eight-year-old student at that school, you're voting now. If you grew up and you have a, a, a best friend in high school, back in 85, my, my range, early 90s, and they were, they were uh, gay, it was looked at differently. It was looked at with this, oh, do you think Anthony's? I think Anthony is. Oh, yeah, he might be one of them. Even if you were supportive, even if you didn't care, even if you loved your pal Anthony, that's how it was discussed. That's how it was looked at. That ain't the case now, generally. I would say generally because someone could probably toss in an example because there's still a lot of bad in the world. If you're a, 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 a teenager in Florida right now and you have a friend that's currently discovering what their gender identity is and, and, and you're supporting them through that journey and they're going to end up on something or end up or, or, or transition through something else. Literally, I'm, I, I, there's, there's the transitioning in terms of uh, how it relates to a transgender person's journey, but also just moving through what they know about themselves, all those kind of things. That's normal to you. It's not normal to my parents. It's not even necessarily normal to me and my generation. This is why I always say those kind of, uh, uh, of groups under attack don't need my, Ken's, personal understanding of every step of the journey. I think they just need my support. And that's the only hope I take from a situation like this week in Allen, Texas, and the one the, the week before, and then the one the week before, and then the one the week before, and the one the years before. Is that eventually, the old guard will go. By voting, by retirement, by death, they will go. And a new day will be here, and a new dawn will break. And so I ask you out there listening... What, what's your part in that? I say in almost every stand-up comedy set I do, I have a line of do not fight change, find your place in change. And I've said it here. I've said it on a four center. It's too long for a t-shirt and no one buys t-shirts anyways. Merch is kind of albatross. Um, but I mean it. I mean it because that's a question I asked myself about two, three years ago when everything was going on. You cannot stop change. 
said Shmi Skywalker to Anakin in one of the more powerful and valuable lessons in Star Wars. You cannot stop change. I, Ken Napsaw, cannot stop change. All right. All right. Cannot stop it. What's my place in that? How do we use it? And why in, in incidences, in incidents uh, where we do fight some sort of change or the idea of change, a lot of stuff going on with AI right now. I am uh, terrified by it. I think it's a dangerous tool. But I also realize technology changes. There could be things, um, situations where maybe something like this can help. So I have to, I have to pull back and be open to it. But I've lost a job. I'm about to lose another job to it. And I think the danger and the fear I have, the danger with it and the fear I have with it, is not the, uh, is not progress in, in, in a technological term. It's those that who would wheel it. Those who would use it as a power, those who would use it as a cost-cutting measure, those who find a computer spitting out a script based on a two-sentence prompt, they find that art versus someone crafting a story out of a lived-in experience, out of a lived-in pain, um, not being able to see or maybe not wanting to see the difference between those two things is where I have some issues right now. But that's part of the nuanced conversation we can still have around things or we hopefully can have around things. But I can't stop it. I can only find my place in change. And that's where I was two, three years ago. What do I want to leave for the generation behind me? Sounds like a real great poetic question. It's a one-act play. Me on a stage with a fake campfire with some of the like the little red, orange, yellow parchment paper flittering with like a little fan and the a crackling sound effect. Me at like a, a you know bench, a corn cob pipe. Is that what it is? Corn cob. You know what I mean? A Popeye pipe puffing away. Well, you can't stop change. So I got to find my place in it. It sounds like BS, but it's real. And I ask myself with everything I want to, you know, put out in the world, podcasts, songs, jokes, poems, live streams, <laughs> you know, who do I want to be? Even if, even if, 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 if a live stream isn't necessarily going to change the world, who do I want to be in that stream? Who do I want to be when I'm talking to people? Who do I want to be in my life? I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm a cantankerous asshole, but I, I'm racked with stubbornness. I'm, I'm completely racked with stubbornness. And fear changed my own life. I hate routine, but don't like changing routines. So what do I want to do with all that? I want to move forward with it because it's going to happen. And with these horrible incidents, these tragedies in the world that can be stopped. You know, including things, uh, climate change, any issues around that, uh, um, these shootings, um, women's rights, anything, plug and play anything in there. This generation's going to grow up with a different view of it, just like previous generations did as well. Because in 1954, the idea of a uh, little black girl walking into a school in the South was enough to bring, nearly bring down the nation. And there's probably some, because that's not long ago, there's probably some who would still think that should bring down a nation. But for the most part, the change has just become wallpaper. It, it just is. Right? just is a lot of people had to fight for that change a lot of people had to be on the front lines of that change and a lot of people lost their life for that change but it happened and it happened in part because the next generation which by the way is a generation holding back a lot of progress now but the next generation came along and that just seemed normal didn't seem weird so that's the only hope i take in this Love to scream, love to get angry, but after a while, that's just that, that's performative for me because that's not where I am right now. My, uh, where I am is you have to find the hope of tomorrow. 
You have to find the hope tomorrow, present today, as best you can. And if if each shooting moves us, fortunate has to happen like that. Because eventually it's going to be someone you know. And eventually it could be you. But if with one more shooting, we move one step closer. I, that's the only fiber of hope I can take out of, her, of, of horrendous, stoppable tragedy. Asterisk by stoppable, because there's always going to be someone that says, well, there's gun laws here. Don't give no fucks. You know what I mean. It's the only thing. It's the only thing. I, I joke at myself. You know, I finally, after all these years, traveled abroad, and, and I'm joking about, now I've learned the ways of the world. I, it's, it's bullshit. I don't know the ways of the world. But I was just stunned at the feeling there, there was a, a mass shooting in America while we were in Europe. And it, it was one of those, it ain't no thing but a chicken wing type of moments. No one over there cared. I, they cared if they were aware of it. They cared because there's loss of life. But we had a couple conversations of people just like, why don't you, why, why don't you all fix that over there? I said on this podcast not too long ago because I was talking about the travel. So I'm not going to remix it. But it's just like, you know, hey, we got crime here. Don't go down that street. Got some knife issues here. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. You know, that's the point to the Greg Abbott's of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say London's doing well emotionally right now. I wouldn't say the UK is doing well emotionally right now. And there's violence and there's tragedies and there's knife attacks. And occasionally guns are involved and occasionally it happens. And occasionally the evil of man creeps through because that's what's going to happen. There's, there's light, there is dark. We've got to do everything we can to stand before those who would push the dark into the light. The people are going to get through. It's always going to happen. But just look at the stats. Look at the numbers. Look at the facts. We'll be here in three more weeks. In three more weeks, I'll be doing a podcast here called Not Again. But here we are. You all know it. I'd love to just do a podcast where I just go, boop, 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 I did something stupid today because I'm Ken. Love that to be my brand. I cannot let that be my brand. Cannot, will not. Don't let it be yours. Doesn't mean we don't need to process. Doesn't need, mean we don't need to take our time. Uh, we process differently. That's, you know, it's tough for me sometimes to, to even understand that in other people. Great Grace and I fought before. We know, well, we know, I, we no longer do. I might tease her on some of her shows, but, you know, she, she always, she loves true crime. And, uh, I, I, you know, there's a lot of comics. I've seen a lot of comics, good comics, local comics. I'm not talking the big wigs, but I've seen a lot of comics do the bits on, you know, my wife, my wife, no, my wife listens to true crime podcasts, these brutal murders. Da, 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 da. And I used to think that I used to think that. And then one day, Grace was like, yeah, because every woman deep down thinks this probably is going to happen to her. And we want to know maybe how to stop it. We want to know how what goes on. We want to know what happens after we're gone. We want to know maybe we might get some kind of justice. The moment she said that. As best I can, because I'm a sniveling little shit at home sometimes. But as best I could, I shut up. We all process things differently. I stared at every detail of this shooting in Allen, Texas. I stared at every detail, just like I stared at every detail of 9-11, just like I stared at every detail of the Challenger explosion, just like I've studied over 275 active shooters in my old job. I still have the, I still have the binder in my, my living room. Um... That's how I process it, I think. It's real. It's there. Could be you. Could be when, not, not if. And how do you get out of it? How do you find your way out of it? And how do we as a country find our way out of it? I think it only happens in the future. Because we've got a lot of people out there. 
love to stand before the wave of change. Stand out there in the ocean. I shall stop change as it fucking takes over you, washes you away. Makes you a footnote in history and on the wrong side of it at that. I do want to talk about other things. I told you up top, I don't I, I never know where these episodes go. I want to get to other things, because that's how we all process it too. And if I was to do 45 minutes on a shooting, our souls might not be able to take it. So we are going to do that thing where I take a quick little break. And it's going to be fun. And if you're on the video version, hi, hi, you'll just see a title card. But on the podcast version, which I hope you listen to the podcast version, uh, as well as watch my face here on YouTube, uh, you're going to go to a commercial break. Um, but this time we're going to talk some things. We're going to talk about some things going on in my life. See how, how it relates to yours. Maybe I'll say a, a stupid thing and um, we'll all be okay. We heal after the break. Let's do it here on The Blathering. That one second, I love, I don't love to to let like a second of air on that commercial break spot, but I have to because that's where I drop the, the marker on the podcast side to let the podcast know that's where the commercial goes. For all you kids in the, looking to get in the biz. I started a job this week. You might even notice, Ken, the blathering's like a day early. Yep, start a little part-time job. It's uh, it's in my industry. It's in the digital media, uh, pop culture industry. Uh, I don't know what I can reveal. It's not like an NDA type of situation. I just, I don't know to what degree it, it matters. But I'll be at a, a, a YouTube-based uh, company this week, uh, starting a little job. And it comes at the right time. Ooh, does it come at the right time? Uh, but it's been an interesting, interesting journey to to get to this. Um, and and I always like to find how this relates to all of you. But uh, I always also love just sharing my journey because I'm a dumb human, and hopefully, you know, you can get something a life lesson out of my dumbness. Um, I from seven. 16, 17 on uh, have, have been working like most of us. I believe in working. Um, I believe in having some sort of work ethic. I don't mind staying late if you need, if that's what the job needs. Um, you know, I don't mind uh, getting getting in there and doing what I have to do on the job. I don't mind showing up at a place. I don't mind having work friends. Most of my connections, some of my biggest connections in life, including relationships, have come from work and from that point on, five days at school, two days, sometimes three days over the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I worked all through high school, uh, through like 10th grade on. Um, so I didn't have much of a social life. Like I, I couldn't necessarily go to the high school football games on Friday nights. I was in a kitchen at a convalescent center washing mush off of plates. And God, I hope that was all it was because often it wasn't. Um, there before the grace of God go we, but we'll all be there. Uh, if if you get that long life there, God bless us. Um, but so I, I I've always worked right, and I believe it. I I I do, you know, I understand. There's a lot of uh, folks out there fighting more and more for the rights of workers, and there's sometimes which which is great, by the way. Um, I've had I've I've had complicated relationships with the idea of unions in the past. Said some things maybe publicly that I, I wouldn't say now for sure, but I've had some bad incidents with, with unions over the years. Um, but that aside, I think there's a great vibe out there right now for, Hey, that's what I think is going on. The, the WGA strike, Starbucks, uh, Starbucks employees, former unions, anything else. I think there's a lot of, Hey, Hey, and as much as I love to work, I like that there's a generation coming up behind us and even a generation in the driver's seat. Now that's what I, I consider the millennials that that's, um, like, no, no, working's great. Having a, a profession that we love is great. Being passionate about your job, cool, great. That's not the problem. But having it dominate every aspect of our life to the point that you, the rest of your life is, 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 is destroyed, that your family life is destroyed, or that you can't even have a family, family life, 
uh, or that you're always working, that you're stressed out and you're slave to the, your money, then you die. Like Richard Ashcroft had it right with the verb, man. And I think that that's not what it's about. It's not it's not about working for those uh, two weeks a year. You get vacation and, you know, used to be I even as a security guard when I started in 1998 and 99, they had uh, the vacation carried over. I one year in, uh, in the year 2000 took nearly four weeks off consecutive at my job as a as a seven dollar an hour security guard because I had vacation that rolled over and I didn't use it in the first year and a half. And then a, a new company came in, a contract security company came in because I used to work directly for the, the mall, the retail, retail proper, property ownership. So it was more of an employee for them. Then a retail uh, security company came in, a, a contract security company, I should say. And uh, they cut all that, right? They cut all We had vacation, but you, got, you, 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 you use it or you lose it. You don't get to save it. And all that kind of stuff happening. And so I like that there's a generation that's like, hey, jobs ain't necessarily the problem, but the less money for more time that destroys our mental health ain't the way it's going to be, buddy. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. And I think I, in the past, too, I had a little bit more of these kids these days attitudes. I, right, when, when, the, when the millennials, the young millennials first hit the, work, uh, the workforce, uh, in force, I was there. I was a younger supervisor, but I was there. And yeah, I had some interesting stories of how to deal with them and or trying to deal with them. Uh, I get it. It's a learning curve for everybody. Um, and they would grow mature anyways, I hope. But but you know, some weird decisions made. I I remember there was there was a point in security where we, you know we used to fight against cell phones. You cannot have your own personal cell phone on you at work, and. You know, it was you. It was a, it was a written a first a verbal warning, then a written warning. Uh, you know, then uh, you were written up if you if we kept catching you with your cell phone on. And my, I, by the way, I'm not saying looking at your cell phone because yeah, I would agree being on patrol and looking at your cell phone. That's not what I'd want as a supervisor. Not not the thing I'd want. But the um, the fact that you even had it on you in your pocket on your belt was a problem. And then I remember at one point there was just this like, again, change cannot be stopped. And there was just this thing of this is just, we they got to find a way to work within this. Um, And I'm, I'm all for, you know, I, I go to movie screenings and some of them do this. Some of them don't, they've changed a little bit, but you know, obviously they don't want to, you know, if you're seeing, Rise of Skywalker a week earlier. They don't want you recording it or going out and taking a picture of something on the screen and, and sharing it with the public. Yeah, yeah they don't want that. Um, so often these these studios would invite all the press people there to these press events, and then they they literally would take their phones. You had to put them in bags that were sealed. And you got a little number, like a coat check number, and then you had to go get your phone afterwards. And, um, you know, I, I don't care. Everyone's, it's nice to be away from your phone for two hours. That's fine. But then, but here, but society's changed, man. And that's a good thing. So if I'm locked away in a movie theater, my dad has a heart attack like he did over 10 years ago. And my mom's got to call me and I'm in a movie theater for two hours. You know, I don't, I don't that you know, it doesn't have to be like that. That used to be how it is. So why do we don't have to accept what it used to be? And then there was an incident where someone, a, 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 there was a medical emergency in a press screen. I wasn't there for this one, but it, it went to the, there was news reports on it. There was a medical emergency in the goddamn press screening. And no one in a theater of 200 people could get their goddamn phones to call because they were locked outside. And they had to rely on uh, the staff and it delayed things. And, and I, I think it turned out okay, but I think that changed the game. And, and now when you go there, um, you carry your phone in. And, and, and that's um, part of this work ethic thing for me. That's all. It's all changed. But I worked within that. I'm going with you idiots. I'm going somewhere with this. Oh, it sounds like I'm yelling at you. Uh, I apologize. No, I, you know, here's the thing. Um, from So from 16 on, I worked, man. I put my head down and I worked. And I enjoyed my free time and I enjoyed it too much. And I got off shift at the security job. And instead of going to, to write a sketch or shoot a short video and upload it on this new thing called YouTube or going to get a stand-up set, I just stayed at home tired and exhausted because I worked too hard. It's my fault, not the job's fault. But that's how I functioned. And, and, and without it, 
I didn't know who I was. If I don't have, if I don't go to the office Monday, who am I? But then I lost my job, and I'd, I'd lost some jobs before, but it was it was younger. Uh, the biggest uh, job loss I had was my radio job uh, in 1998, and I was at home, and that's when I decided, all right, nuts to this, I'm moving to LA. And I coached a baseball team, collected some unemployment for a little bit, lived at home, no rent, um, food taken care of. Still struggled, but then I was able to get on my feet enough and, and, and uh, get a job in the movie theater and head to L.A. and start anew. So 2018, I get, I get cut from Collider, jumped in out of the plane with no parachute, pushed out. And it's been the greatest thing for me because it's, it's, it's spun me into so many directions I was too afraid to go into. I still think I should work harder, still think I should have more success, but I wouldn't have, I, I, I'd be, if, if Collider had not let me go, or if I'd ended up in another company and I went straight from there to some other company full time, I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't be who I am right now. I wouldn't have written that book. I, I wouldn't have started streaming video games. I wouldn't have figured out this tech. That I'm, I'm broadcasting an OBS. I didn't even figure that out till the last year and a half. I should have figured out that, but I, I wouldn't even know what this was because we didn't know that stuff. We just wrote in the office or went on camera to talk about movies. And we had Adam and Cody and Christian and and later others uh, like Remsen uh, in, in the booths or shooting the pressing the record buttons. Right. We didn't pay attention to that stuff that I had to. That I had to. But here's the other thing, the other side of it, where I'm at right now. So that's the journey. I've talked about that before. You don't know. You don't know. You look back and, and a horrible failure losing my job forced me to survive and, and hopefully thrive on my own. I ran up a lot of credit card debt. I'm still paying for, will always be paying for, uh, you know, life hasn't been as comfortable, but that's a good thing, I think. But here's the other side of it, man. I've hit some professional lows in 2023. It's, it's been exhausting. And as much as having a full-time job and working for the weekends and uh, taking your family out to the lake once a year, as much as that can kind of rob you as, of, of your mental health and some joy, I find that constraining, but I've always needed it, right? But then I lost it and I started to find that this is what I, how I wanted to live. Like, I kind of like this. I always, I always liken it to, remember when you were sick in like elementary school? Maybe junior high, when you still were young enough, high school's a little too old, but you know, when you, you were young enough to be like, what's going on out there in the world? I'm homesick. Everyone's at school. It's the old playing hooky thing, right? And it was always weird. And maybe, maybe you weren't, I remember one time I had to go get my, my, my braces put on or something like that. And my mom took me to, we got a, I got a butterscotch milkshake and rented a, 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 a VHS tape. I rented a WWE like SummerSlam 88 video or something like that. Uh, I'll remember that. No, so I, I remember, I think it was SummerSlam 89. Cause I think that's one, the brain busters, Arn Anderson and Telly Blanchard were on. Someone looked that up. Um, but I remember getting that butterscotch milkshake and, and walking out of the, the movies to go on Grand Avenue and thinking, well, I'm getting away with something. Everyone else is at school, but I'm, I'm running free. I love that feeling. And that's what it's like to work freelance in my business, at least, or in comedy or in YouTube, digital media or writing, right? Without a, a port in the storm. Every day I wake up, I feel like I'm playing hooky. And that can be, it's, it's number one, it's a lifestyle I like, but it's addictive. And anything addictive could be a problem. So as things started to become tougher and I started losing out on some of the freelance jobs that I had, ring announcing for Schmo's No, excuse me for, uh, well, that's a flashback, ring announcing for Schmo Down was a great gig. As much as over the years uh, I've expressed some sort of frustration with, with the Schmo Down overall or just how that whole situation ended or ended up being. I, that, that last season we did in the studio with me ring and y'all went, I loved it. I had, I had a lot of fun with it and it, 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 it paid okay. Uh, to the point where I wasn't as stressed, right? And uh, two days out of the month, maybe three, I, we'd go to the studio, block, knock it all out in one big block. Mark Ellis and I and Andrew Guy would go get some chicken sandwiches somewhere. You know, make out in a car with Andrew Guy or something like that over a chicken, spicy chicken sandwich. And life was good. Kidding. I'm kidding. 
he rebuffed me. Um, and that that was gone. And uh, jobs at fandom started going. And, and you know, I, I'm not blazing up YouTube. All right, no need to deny it. I have pop rock and radio. I'm lucky to get seven people watching live these days, right? And I'm thankful for every soul that does. But that's just where it's at. And it's not me. It's not you. It's just where it's at. And so about a year or so ago, I realized this constant swimming from little island to little island is 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 starting to kill me as much as staying on one island was in the past. And I have to adapt and I have to change. But there lies the struggle. Change, as it turns out, is hard. It is. Always and forever. So I started to slowly reach out, get little jobs here and there. End of last year, I actually had a great job uh, working uh, for fandom, but it was this other division of fandom. It was this great part-time job. It took some energy, and it was comically not even low pay. It was like $10 for everything I did. I'm talking literally $10 for every little thing I did. I had to write questions for them for their wiki pages. But I could do 2,000 of them a month and that would be the deal. I get paid, you know. And then um, that job went away fast. It was like a great answer to my problems. I have some funds, some capital to pay down some debt and fund the, the, the stuff I want to do here in my home studio. I lost the job, couldn't figure out why, was eventually revealed that I lost it to AI programs. What are you going to do? Um, so I got stubborn and I, and I started digging my heels and I, and I wanted to, to grow my own stuff here. And I still want to grow. I sound like a pothead, don't I? No disrespect to potheads. I'd love to have everyone love uh, my YouTube short videos of either the Fortnite stuff or the SNN traffic. Or, they're not. I'd love my ASMR channel to be as popular as other ASMR channels. It's not. It might. I'm not stopping it. I've seen steady growth in that channel. It's the tiniest snail movement of, 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 of advancement, but I'm seeing it. I'm not giving up. But I'm, I'm exhausted and I'm stressed. And in February, I became suicidal as I addressed on this program. And it was because I was tired of swimming to all these little islands. I still want to swim island to island, but I need to get to a bigger island that sticks around, that I can keep, I can swim from that island and go back to it. So an opportunity was presented to me a couple weeks ago, and I did what I always do. I fought it. Aggressively. And a friend was like, hey, I think I might have this opportunity for you. It's part time. You can force center can still be your focus. Don't you worry. You can do other things, stand up comedy. But I, I think I have a good opportunity for you. Pays it, but you know, it's pay. And it's something that could lead us, you know, could help you. It could get your name out there again. Because that's the thing, too. I'm on those islands. I'm not on a big island that people go vacation on. I always joke and it stings and it hurts, but I get it. When I pop up on YouTube streaming Fortnite and someone in the chat goes, oh, where have you been since 2018? I, I get pissed, but I don't necessarily get pissed at you. I just get pissed at myself and the situation and the industry. It is what it is and the algorithm. So I fought it, though. I fought it. I fought it with my friend who was off. He, he took me to lunch and offered me this gig. And I was like, fuck you. Fuck you. It's like, whoa, whoa, I'm trying to help you. I was like, I don't f fuck you. I don't want this chance. He's like, but you need this chance. I was like, I, yee. So last week, I went in for an interview, a job interview. I ain't gone to no job interview since Collider. And prior to that, I won at Screen Junkies and a couple during my time in security where I was either going for other jobs in uh, our company, or there was one time I interviewed for a position within a, a city council office in, in, in LA. But other than that, like, job interviews are an interesting thing, man, right? I, and I didn't know how to do it. And, and I think that was part of the fear, a part of me fighting the change. I, didn't, I don't want to go back to an island and, and suffocate slowly on an island. 
a work island. But we don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. I think one of the things when you learn things about yourself in a, in a working situation, a work, a, a relationship, romantic or otherwise, a partnership, uh, each failure should move you forward. And you should learn a little bit about yourself. Part of the problem was uh, when I got to some of those islands, whether it be a, a day job like security or screen junkies, which had a bunch of problems attached to it. But at the end of the day, it was a good opportunity, good job. Collider video, I chose to go there. Every time I got to one of these professional islands, I'm the one that put up a hammock and said, I guess I die here. I didn't work on other pursuits and didn't continue other things. I didn't do any of that till I was kicked off the island. That doesn't have to be the case. Life isn't this black or white situation. It is not this binary yes or no, do or don't. So, after having a couple mini me mental breakdowns before I agreed to this interview, I had to realize what it was. The, the, the thought was, pff, if I take this opportunity, which, by the way, I have $8 to my name, so I kind of need to say yes. So I knew that was the problem. I kind of needed to say yes. I got myself in that position. My fear was... Once I got there, all other things were dead. This show, Force Center, streaming, writing songs, poetry, stand-up comedy, going on the road with Mark Ellis. That I, If I stepped in that office to even interview, it was all dead. But that ain't the truth. That's not how it has to be. It might have, it might have been like that in the past. But you can change right there along with the change and take what you know about yourself forward. The next relationship or the next chapter in your relationship can be better and will be better when you bring the new you forward. So I went to this job interview and by the way, I, th I thought it was kind of a given, right? I'm going to be honest with you. A little ego check. I thought, I thought I was like one of like two or three people they were thinking about bringing on board. Turns out they brought in a fleet of people. A fleet of people. As they should, by the way. But I went in there with a different kind of attitude, a different kind of freedom within my soul. That I'm not putting on some sort of, uh, uh, I'm just not strapping myself in that I can't move, that I can't adjust, that I can't swim away from this new island. And I went with a, a freedom in my soul that ended up helping me. Not only did I win them over in the interview, some of the things that they were going to have me do, I'm going to do. But some of the things that I wanted to do, but that I had been told you would not not be able to do, it looks like that might not be the case. Because of how I presented myself and, and, and how I approached it. I got to admit that I was scared. I drive in there too. Just uh, forget the big emotional reasons. Driving there. In my car. By the way, Six minutes from my house, maybe, unless I hit a stoplight. Driving there, I was nervous as, as, as a kid, uh, you know, the first day of high school. Do you remember high school? God, I was terrified first day of high school. There's a theme in my life, a new thing, a new change, something bigger than I can control. What do I do? I don't want to go to ninth grade. Oh, I fought that. I fought that. You can't stop it, though, unless you don't want to go to school. And within a couple of days, the new normal emerged. High school was survivable for me. So at the time of this recording, I start uh, tomorrow. It's part-time. I'm not in an office a lot. I have a lot of things I'm going to do. My recording schedules might change. Um, my energies for some of the other things I do might change, but it is in my power to do all of it. When I was 26, 27 coming out of a, a big disaster professionally where I did not get moved on in the groundlings and my dream of Saturday Night Live seemed to be damaged. It, it wasn't necessarily, but I damaged it. Instead of coming home from work, peeling off the old uniform and sitting on my couch and turning on ESPN's Pardon the Interruption and just thinking, well, 
this is all I can do now until someone gives me another opportunity. Now I'm not going to do that. Now when I come home, I'm going to work harder. Now when I come home, I'm going to work on my own things as well with the same energy and gusto. And what I was able to do this weekend with a little less pressure of trying to scrape by, can I sell a goddamn t-shirt to eat? A little less of that pressure on me this weekend. And by the way, I have no paychecks have come in, but just emotional less pressure. The change, the change moving me forward allowed me to have a, a Sunday that was uh, out of my routine. Grace and I went for a hike. We've never done that. We took the dogs, oh, a little Franny on a hiking trail. We went and had lunch on a Sunday we, at a restaurant. We, we've never done that. I felt so good. I felt so good because I allowed the change to drive for once. So that's the show. That's what we do here at The Blathering. I blather, I barf, the microphone catches it, and I hope it has some sort of meaning to you. And occasionally I do stupid things. Occasionally the show is about how I uh, felt really bad because instead of buying Smuckers on Crustables this weekend, I saved 30 cents a box and I bought some Market Pantry Crustalises. And I felt bad. I felt like I let Smuckers down. We'll do an episode about that. Do about it. I'll do, do episodes about all that. Thanks for supporting me. Thanks for listening. If you're on the Patreon page, uh, look at the merch tier. If you want to bump up and get the Hope shirt, uh, consider that. If you want to uh, support me on my journey, because I got a lot of things I'm not done getting to. And one of the things coming out, oh, it's, it's, it's working on it from different angles here, but I'm going to be releasing my first comedy EP uh, uh, based off what I uh, recorded in London. It's going to be raw, going to be rough. It's going to be fun. Um Sounded like I did an ad for something else, but it's a comedy CD, not even a CD. God, look at me. What a Gen Xer I am. Comedy CD. It's a comedy recording. You'll be out soon. It's one of the things I'm happy to work on. And no island can take that away from me. See you next time here in The Blathering. Mm-hmm.